and Yale, the mid-run institutions. But sp specifically on South Africa is the fact that the Pan-African Parliament set up in the year much, much earlier than envisaged. Because the Pan-African Parliament was supposed to be set up around 2028, 2029, would be the last fits into. And it also helps to underscore the AU as a global player for any kind of governance that will come up. Now, when all is said and done, the Abuja Treaty, like I said earlier, cannot be exhausted on this show. An understanding of it can only be quietly explained so that we get a sense, we leave this show, we get that takeaway that, yes, this is what the Abuja Treaty is, was, has done, and continues to do, and we must understand it, and that if we were tested right now, today, on Africa's integration, what particular treaty could we talk about, about Africa's integration? Just like we talk about Kwame Nkrumah, Haile Selassie, NASA, and all these other greats when we talk about Africa. Even document that we are living through uh, in, 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 in Africa's integration. At the end of the day, it's all about the Africa we want. But make no mistake, the Africa we want predates 2013 and the Agenda 2063. It just so happens that it was an important time to celebrate, uh, and that's why 2013, the Agenda 2063 was formalized at the time. I don't know how many Africans would, want, would not want their country or region or continent on their home to be peaceful, prosperous, and happy. I certainly would want it, and I'm sure you would want it too. But for me, in summary, the biggest takeaway from all this is about getting back to our roots. It's about remembering Franklin's, Benjamin Franklin's quote, about from whence we came, where we are going, and to whom we must account. I said earlier last week that the Abuja Treaty reminds us from whence we came. Progress surely has on Africa, uh, integration uh, elites and policy makers, at building a better continent for us all, but well, well inherent and well ensconced in for the regional as well as the continental. But what it has even done better is set the stage for Agenda 2063 and growing teeth and that are building capacities to be better and serve African people even better. Idea. Is peer review a necessary evil? Can Africa still have good governance? If it's at least yes, to all of these. Then join me next time, Mr. Junior. Thank you for spending your time with me and hope to speak to you next time. Have a great day. Goodbye. And as we know, smartphone connectivity has already transformed much of the way how students are accessing higher education in Africa. So we will see what what kind of um, uh, uh, what what kind of experiences you now have in the continent, and uh, what do you think? Where are the bottlenecks, and and where are the the opportunity uh, over the Kaiser again. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa. And um, 
as part of our project, um, I have authored uh, a policy note that actually was published this week. It hasn't been launched yet, but I'm um, sharing it here as a soft launch with you. It's called Resources, Relevance and Impact, and it talks about the key challenges for universities in Africa. Um, and, and it forms part of kind of a, a larger, I will share the link to it. Um, the other day, uh, organized by the International Association of Universities, the IAU. Uh, and there's a professor there from Ethiopia, uh, Professor Tamrat, and he was talking about the previous normal and the new normal. So I, I borrowed a little bit from him and I added a few points. But I think just before we launch into the discussion, it's kind of important to contextualize um, a little bit. Uh, the previous normal for, for the continent uh, was growing economies for most uh, countries, some with the highest growth in the world. Uh, we could see kind of a predicted growth. Uh, we had a growing young population as well, which meant that ex economies were expanding. Uh, universities were having a key role in this uh, development, but of course access uh, is highly unequal, even when universities admit more students. Uh, the share of poor students is the elites that have access to higher education. Uh, digitalization was budding, but also had huge barriers, such as low bandwidth, high costs, and of course, power irregularities. Um, our societies were interconnected, uh, but there was also huge dependency on foreign solutions. Uh, now we're into a new normal. Economies all over the world are contracting, but there's huge uncertainty. We don't know when this crisis is ending. Um, we don't know exactly how it will um, affect us, but we can guess that it will affect the, uh, the, the people who are already struggling more than, than the others. Uh, we're now focused on protecting lives and livelihoods. Uh, universities have closed all over the world. Um, where did I have my numbers on that? Uh, I think it was, um, was it 9.8 million students on the continent that are currently not going to university as they usually were before. Um, so we have been thrown into online learning and working from home. Um, and in the seminar um, with Professor Tamrat, he was talking about the silver lining that um, where the dependency was on foreign solutions before you can already see that now you're on your own. So you have to find local solutions and homegrown solutions. And that means he was suggesting um, um, a, a kind of a new approach, a new mindset. Um, so, that, so that was just a little bit of, of context to this conversation. And today we're focusing on access and digitalization. And I think with that, as planned, we're launching into um, the early you, with us your presentation COVID-19 lockdown can South African universities guarantee quality e-learning for students with disabilities the floor is yours if you want to unmute yourself yes I'm ready okay so you have 10 minutes and I've asked Camilla to be our timekeeper so she will let you know when you have three minutes left and then when you have one minute left, and then we ask that you wrap up. Okay, thank you. Thank you too. And, and those of you who feel more comfortable turning off your camera, you can, you can do so. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dizachi Wandire. I just finished uh, my PhD at Rhodes University focusing on the inclusion of students with. So the title for my presentation is uh, Lock, uh, COVID-19 Lockdown. Can South African universities guarantee quality e-learning for students with disabilities? So basically, I was mainly interested on the issue of uh, how, you know, 
touch size already provided the historical background, you know, on how universities internationally uh, have been forced to switch to e-learning, you know, for all students, including students with disabilities. So I won't provide much historical background uh, on that. You know, South Africa is one of the universities which has also resorted to e-learning, you know, and this is a new phenomenon, especially in South Africa and most African universities to having to focus uh, to adopt e-learning, you know, they've mainly been uh, contact universities. So if you look in the South African context, you know, when it comes to the inclusion of students with disabilities, uh, this is a group of students we have mainly been excluded when it comes to educational opportunities. Why? Because more emphasis has mainly been uh, uh, focused on, uh, on their non-disabled peers. You know, if there's issues of curriculum, it's always curriculum from the perspective of uh, non-disabled students. So I think it's important for me to begin by defining uh, the concept of, inclus uh, of inclusive education. So the dominant uh, definition of inclusive education is supporting uh, learners with disabilities so that they are able to be involved with their non-disabled peers to the maximum extent possible. So mainly this is a concept which emphasizes uh, the need for students with disabilities to be supported, you know, on the same level with their non-disabled peers, mainly in what is often referred to as the regular classroom setting. So very often it involves adapting the curriculum in, in order to ensure that, you know, students with disabilities are equally supported. So when we talk about inclusive education, mainly, you know, there is what I refer to as five pillars of inclusive education, you know. So if a, an educational institution can meet these uh, uh, five, uh, five criteria, then it shows that, you know, that particular educational institution, you know, could be considered as a best practices in terms of supporting students with disabilities. So very often funding is one of the most important uh, aspect of inclusive education. And in South Africa, we've got uh, what is often referred to as national specialists, which provides uh, funding for students with disabilities to access higher education, and also provide uh, funding for assistive devices, any form of support which can enable students to succeed. The other supporting uh, mechanism is the provision of reasonable accommodations, which varies depending on the student's uh, disability. Uh, you know, for let's say for students with specific learning disabilities, this could come in the form of extra time. And the other aspect is uh, accessible built environment, you know. There is a need for universities to, to build uh, their uh, buildings in line with the universal design principles so that they can be accessible, particularly for students with physical disabilities or mobility challenges, including those uh, with other disabilities. You know, this could be students with visual impairments, and there's also the provision of, us, uh, of assistive devices. This mainly applies to students uh, with visual impairments. And there's also the need to ensure that the curriculum is accessible to students with diverse disabilities. And this involves the role of lecturers. So for purposes of this presentation, I was mainly interested on the impact of uh, COVID learning you know, through the lens of students with disabilities and support staff members. So I designed uh, a questionnaire like which had like uh, five questions, you know, which I forwarded to students with disabilities at one institution. And uh, I also forwarded it to support staff members. So in the questionnaire, what I was mainly interested in was to explore, you know, which academic year the student is and the faculty you know, their disability and how the lockdown is affecting or has affected their learning, how their university is supporting them, you know, this could include lecturers, you know, tutors or, you know, any relevant stakeholders within their universities. 
I was also mainly interested in potential challenges and opportunities of remote uh, learning, you know, that has been, that they are currently experiencing. So the questionnaire for disability unit staff members, you know, in Africa, they, of, they are often referred to as disability unit staff members, but in other, in other settings, you know, they are referred to as uh, disability coordinators, but yeah. So I was mainly interested on the measures that their unit are actually taking to support students uh, with disabilities. And uh, I wanted to hear from their opinions that which uh, category of students uh, disabilities with disabilities are more likely to be affected by remote learning and why. I was also interested on the support, you know, that they are, the lecturers and tutors are providing during the lockdown you know, if they are doing any form of collaboration. And also I was interested in potential challenges and opportunities, you know, that could be uh, that emanate from the, from the lockdown. So from the findings, you know, the findings, you know, so basically five students responded and most of these students, most of all of them had invisible disabilities, which ranged from depression, anxiety, epilepsy, you know, and I used snowball sampling, you know, so I contacted one student that I know with an invisible disability who then referred me to her, uh, to her friends who also contributed to the study. So what I found the dominant finding amongst students with disabilities, they felt that uh, the university tends to use a one-size-fits-all approach you know, when it comes to the inclusion of students with disabilities. And this was more of like two-sided that, you know, universities seems to focus mainly on non-disabled students at the cost of, of disabled students. Even within students with disabilities themselves, they felt that, you know, students with disabilities are treated as a homogenous group, you know. So with more attention pay, being paid on students, with the visible disabilities at the cost of students with invisible disabilities. So this is a dominant thing. Three minutes remaining. So the other challenge is, is that, you know, there was a, the dominant thing was that look, for some students, you know, there was a emphasis, especially from disability unit staff members that specific learning disabilities uh, more will be disproportionately affected in comparison to their peers, especially because for blind students, most of them they rely on assistive devices, you know, they have access in disability units. But now that they are learning from uh, home remotely, you know, they don't have access to those assistive devices. The same also applies to students with specific learning disabilities who rely on scribes. Because they are working from home, they will be disadvantaged from that particular access. And also, there is an issue of socioeconomic, uh, one socioeconomic background. You know, in South Africa, universities are divided in historically black institutions and historically white institutions. So, participants from historically black institutions raised concerns about, you know, how most of the students live in remote areas. You know. So therefore, those students will be more affected when it comes to issues of uh, connectivity. Other participants, uh, disability unit staff members, spoke about uh, how first-year students with disabilities are more likely to be affected because you know this group is in its early phase because this was the first semester. So this group is in its uh, early phase of trans transitioning to university. So most of them are still learning about how to use assistive devices and all that. So they felt that, you know, this group... Sorry? One minute remaining. When it comes to some students, they felt that, you know, when it comes to opportunities, there will be flexibility, you know, because most universities are quite flex flexible on... Uh, deadlines, you know, lecturers are not supposed to impose strict deadlines as they will do if it's conduct sessions. So they felt that, you know, that's an opportunity that could be created 
uh, by learning from uh, remotely. And some participants uh, felt that the delivery of hard copy material could help them. You know, especially this participant uh, has epilepsy and she was speaking about how she can stay on the computer for a long time. Other participants felt that, you know, students with uh, physical disabilities are less likely to be affected by learning remotely, you know, especially if they, if they are learning in universities where there is, uh, which uh, the built environment is inaccessible. Uh, when it comes to some felt that, you know, this will create an opportunity for lecturers to move away from their comfort zone, you know, especially because most lecturers in African universities, including South Africa, have mainly been used uh, to teaching students through contact sessions. So this could encourage them to learn about how to use technology in order to support students from an e-learning standpoint. So in terms of conclusions and recommendations, there was emphasis that you know, students, uh, lecturers need to learn uh, about universal design for learning. You know, so that they can be able to create and deliver the curriculum that could be accessible to students with diverse disabilities online. And lastly, there was emphasis on connectivity to say even though the universities are providing laptops, you know, to, to students with disabilities, it's important to emphasize the issue of connectivity because without connectivity, some students will be excluded. You know, so online learning could provide uh, equitable opportunities, provided these uh, adequate opportunities to ensure that you know connectivity is enhanced. So that's all from my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Desire, for your uh, presentation. Um, if there are anyone who has questions, you can write your name in the chat. Um, I had a question kind of relating to your last point about connectivity for the students that you um, did survey. What was their um, connectivity situation? Did they have um, a fixed line at home or did they get any help from the university or they used their phones? What was the uh, mode of connectivity, if you want? So for most of the students, you know, I think this year has to do with uh, privileged, privilege because most of this, all the students that I, uh, I interviewed are from a historically white uh, institution. So most of them seem to have their own laptops and the institution is providing them with data. So most of them don't necessarily seem to have any challenges with connectivity. The only issue that they had was the issue of not having uh, more opportunities to interact with their supervisors. And also remember, these are postgraduate students. They don't necessarily need to be on, uh, they don't use, uh, they don't have many courses. They're just focusing on, the, uh, on their postgraduate studies. Some of them are doing their masters. But it's a different aspect now to historically black institutions because in these institutions you find out that some students don't even have a laptop. Yeah. And they're okay. still waiting for the university to provide them with one. Yes, imagine to do online studies and online work, working from home without a laptop, that is um, a challenge. Thank you so much, Desire. I think if there are more questions, we have to push them to the discussion later on. And now we are moving on to Professor Stian Hoagbe, and he will talk to us about partnership on a shoestring, how to foster sustainable research networks in Corona times and beyond. Stian, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kaisa. It's a great pleasure to be, be here. I've entitled my presentation, Partnership on a Shoestring, and let me start by what I mean with that. I think that uh, uh, the partnership is the kind of term used a lot in uh, terms of development cooperation, in terms of uh, academic cooperation. But of course, partnership is also an implication and an expectation of having funding and institutional and muscles and resources in various ways. And uh, what I want to talk about is how to make a partnership on a shoestring on a, with a low budget 
moving on working in that sense. And I take as my point of departure uh, the lab research laboratory that we have recently founded between Burkina Faso, Mali. Uh, we call it Le Laboratoire d'Anthropologie Comparative Engagée et Transnationale. So uh, a, a research lab for the comparative, engaged, and transnational anthropology. And this is built up of a, a, a group of researchers who have been working together. We have been working for, for years, for a very long time. And finally, we felt our efforts. And we did so without a single dime. We didn't have any money involved in this because we have ongoing research projects. We have ongoing collaborations is with specific individuals. But we felt that we need to have something that is beyond a specific program or a specific project and so forth. And uh, we, in this, in this research lab, if you set up a research lab without any specific funding, core funding attached to it, how do you do it? Well, you have to start with a shoestring. And this is started well beyond, well, well before the corona times, was to set up a virtual uh, between a webinar, which is not spectacular which is not fancy, but it's just the ordinary academic work that we do when we share papers, we read student papers, we are sharing viewpoints and so forth. Participants of these seminars have to, put, have to read the papers in advance. And by, to do this, we use, uh, either you can send out the papers, but often we use a, a space there. there. Uh, to echo what has already been said, I think that what we see in Corona times is that all inequalities that, that we already know and know well are getting more and more accentuated. Because online education requires connect connection. And I think it's worth remembering Jim, James Ferguson's uh, uh, distinction in his book Expectations on Moder of Modernity when he said that disconnection is not the absence of connection, but connected. And I think we have all experienced that when we sit in meetings and all of a sudden nobody can hear what you say or you, you can't see the images or the PowerPoints and so forth. So in that sense, I think it's, it's so important that we, we recognize this and we also find what are the impacts for us <clears throat> to emphasize, and this is my main point, that let's not focus on um, uh, software, but focusing on, I mean, ITC software, but let's focus on pedagogical skills, research skills, and how to do it. A third example of, of uh, doing a partnership on the shoestring, or at least doing, uh, handling this current time, is that I, I am giving currently a PhD course uh, at uh, Uppsala University, and one of the participants, Marcia, she will be talking afterwards. And in that PhD course, we have two Mozambican PhD students in Uppsala, all the lectures, in order to, if there is this connection, we can also be, the person can be, it could be possible for the person to look at the, the lecture afterwards. This is not to be spread. It's just me studying for a long time. So I don't want to be shared. Uh, it's not my best side, but I think it's, it's a very kind of functional way of approaching issues. Uh, I have two, two more points and then I will stop. Uh, one way that, that uh, um, Corona has also impacted my, my work is that I have been contacted by uh, University Nazi Boni, which is the University of Bobo Jurasso in Burkina Faso. Three minutes. Yeah, and uh, they have, uh, uh, Professor Patrice Tui contacted me and they are now going to launch a study of uh, studying the barrier measures taken by the Burkina Bay government and civic liberties that are taking place in the time of, of Corona. And I think that is a very innovative way of doing. And uh, gladly, uh, they got funding for this. And I will play the role of being a kind of advisor in beyond the insecurity and crisis in West Africa, here in Uppsala in June this year. And uh, of course, this was extremely frustrating seeing that it was citizens' insecurity, violence, uh, political turmoil, and so on. 
I think that a great impact of the corona situation will be that we will organize a, a roundtable on the corona pandemic in one way or another. So in that sense, I think it's, it's the lesson we need to... The world is as it used to be. It's just very different times we are living in. And that's why we should not start uh, uh, reassessing everything. I was thinking about um, when you do this, do you feel like from your experience, maybe also from the PhD course you were talking about, do you need to meet in person before for this to work or is that possible? And so the question is kind of, do we need the personal meetings? We can replace them with Zoom and online technology or Yes, you're, yeah, you're yeah. I, I, I think that, that uh, we would like to meet, I would like to meet all of them. I would like to, to, to inter interact uh, normally with people. But if that's not possible, I think that uh, this opens, uh, what we often do is that I open up the session at two o'clock as I open my, my ordinary classroom and then students and uh, we can chat. And I think that uh, the Mozambican uh, uh, contingent, they are chatting about what's going on at home and the uh, news from the country and so on. And then at 14 minutes, 15, and 15 minutes past, which is the academic quarter in Uppsala, then we start. And then we also, so we, we try to encourage this kind of social interaction and, and, and so on. Uh, I must say, and I think this is maybe, maybe an answer to your question, I don't, uh, we don't res record the seminar part of the session. And I was cancelled, and for some reason, I think a technical issue related to e-governance in the domain of education in Cameroon. So the opportunity regarding our uh, roundtable today, the op uh, I think this is uh, the opportunity to assess the role of uh, that particular ministry through public actions carried out by university in the domain of e-learning, e-education, and digitalization and research. So, coming to the first point, e-national higher education program and e-learning public university in Cameroon. Uh, first of all, uh, let's say uh, this is the major policy reference of ICT development in higher education, which is uh, Call to respond to to uh, seven axes. I I can come back to it later if uh, it's necessary. And uh, this national uh, higher education, this national this program has particularly contributed since 2016 to putting in putting pressure university <laughs> on designing uh, uh, that have to design and modernize their website. The first thing and other virtual platform for more societal visibility, inclusion, and democratization of information as well, as well as for more transparent administrative uh, practices. I explain. Since the program has been put in place, we have observed every two years a kind of evaluation that, has, uh, that is guided both by CAMES, which is a regional institution of higher education in Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, the ministry itself. This, uh, the second point is also that it has uh, resulted for three years now in the student equipment with free laptops and online registration facilities. Regarding the free laptops, these are uh, uh, mobile computers that are offered to every registered uh, student at public, uh, public university in Cameroon. And uh, Another point is that uh, I consider this as uh, an absolute opportunity to open up to, for opening up to globalization and the broadening of public university visibility. So the question that came into mind regarding the COVID-19 uh, pandemic were about three but I will try to answer uh, to them uh, according to my own experience. 
Uh, the first is, does this apply to all public university and higher education program in Cameroon? How do Cameroon public university embrace e-learning and digitalization in the context of COVID-19 pandemic? And to what may be considered in the COVID-19 pandemic context as the new normal, how do public university in Cameroon to, uh, uh, adapt to digital technologies? So, to answer to those uh, preliminary question and exploratory uh, research, we have attempted to, uh, to, to examine key points, one key point, actions carried out by public university administration as well as lecturers and student reaction in relation to this, consider that uh, uh, major policy reference we mentioned earlier. And, uh, uh, after our preliminary uh, um, inquiries, what we've realized is that there have been rapid policy changes. So in a situation, in a, in a situation where there was like, okay, uh, not real uh, uh, engagement regarding the, 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 the digital technologies, there have been having ha happy policy changes, prompt adaptation, and, but also reluctance or absence. Rapid development of public, mission, uh, of public measures. This has been observed through the, the diverse public meetings organized to try to find out solutions to the, to the context. There has also been design of e-learning platform within university website and for registered students. But while some of them are really functional from a direct internet access, others are not yet functional, but they are visible on the, on the university website, what is already quite good. The third point is the mobilization. Yes, the the third point is the mobilization of virtual platforms such as radio for teaching purpose in level four, level one, and two students, and intense use of WhatsApp group to share courses and other educative educative digital contents. Another point is the organization of video conference for e defense. However, in schools such as ERIC, the above initiatives are still limited to private master programs, which uh, most of them are engaged in uh, international cooperation with other university partners. In this particular case, we also observe that while some lecturers and teachers seem already familiar to professional discussion with their students using digital platforms, others seem in a total process of adaptation. Some categories go used to the utilization of digital technology to share professional contents of all kinds, find it difficult to adapt themselves to digital approach to teaching and group interaction within a fixed hour period. But what has been surprising is definitely the capacity of all the categories to comply with the situation and overcome personal and societal challenge. Regarding the absence uh, has a result, in line with the absence, we have noticed that other public programs offered by the school uh, EM, here in IRIC have been totally interrupted. Planning a resume only in June 1st, 2020, has announced by the government. Regarding the strengths and challenges, the last point, in public universities such as the University of Yaoundé 2, students from level 3 to 5 are happy with the initiative for the low cost in terms of access constraint. I'll come back to it, uh, maybe through question constraint and online availability of completed courses program. For my own online experience teaching, uh, online experience using WhatsApp group in a specific program at the I found it the process more demanding. Any written material should be very precise. Imagination works much more. I had to learn to use my phone devices, get to platform on time and keep students alert for at least four hours. So, but beyond this, we have noticed problem of access, some lecture electorals to digital technology and the inability to share written courses within the interval 20 hours. So uh, maybe I can come back, come back to, to way forward later. And, but I think uh, COVID-19 pandemic has been a great opportunity to explore free online platform digitalized Think about digitalizing library contents and acquire learn and, um, and try to learn to use library databases. And uh, regarding the time constraint, I think I can hand here and come back to discussion later. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mireille. I think it's uh, great work that you've been able to 
start your research on, on actually how the COVID crisis is um, affecting um, the implementation of plans already there. Uh, very positive that they have been uh, fast forwarded. But you mentioned also problems of access, especially for your students. We, we spoke before today and you, you're running an entire course on WhatsApp. Uh, are all your students able to join that course, for instance? What are some of yeah. You can talk a little bit more uh, on, on problems yeah. of access. And then Michael yeah. has a question as well. Yeah. Yes, um, I can say if uh, uh, WhatsApp was the solution in that particular case, because this was the, 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 the cheaper, the cheaper uh, uh, digital technologies available to students, and uh, has um, has a virtual platform. It was also the 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 best alternative for the for the school that had a modernized platform, virtual platform. And according to the experience I had, um, uh, the problem of access. What is interesting here is that the problem of access is not only was not only linked to internet. It was also linked to energy provide 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 provision, electricity, has there have been uh, many shortage, cuts of light, cutting light, uh, uh, things like that, that have been preventing, uh, that have prevented some students to, to be present at times and um, attend the course. Mali. Me, even me, I've been victim of uh, that uh, electricity shortage. So I think what is interesting here is maybe regarding the digital uh, technologies, it's is close relationship with the use of energy, electricity, energy, which is also a challenge here in Africa, in, uh, in Cameroon, in a particular environment. That's why I, I, I really focus on the problem of access, and I think this can be the contribution to the, to the debate, in terms about linking the, the, the both. Excellent. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, uh, um, thank you so much for this um, wonderful presentation. Um, I, when, you, when I was going through your slide, I was happy to note that um, since 2016, Cameroon has been uh, kind of getting prepared for such a um, pandemic. And uh, what I want to ask a question uh, from the universities, have the yes. universities done enough, like enough to digitalize the system? Like... Can the student get access to the academic result transcript to the university website? Also, yeah. the university, do they have like functioning Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi for the students? Because it, it's, it's definitely have to start from the universities if they want to go digital. And secondly, the use of radio, mm -hmm. the fact that radio uh, broadcast is limited to the view of only the presenter, do you think like is uh, a very a good means of um, lecturing the students? So this is my, these are my questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, J. Michael, for your questions. And regarding the experience from universities, access to transcript uh, via online digital platform, and it, 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 it all depends. As I said, it all depends. There are some universities that have been able to adapt quickly because they on their website and platform, uh, this I kind of services already available online. For example, you can, uh, I can mention the University of Buea, the University of, uh, yes, the University of Buea and the University of Douala, uh, whom I was, I, I could realize yesterday running the website that they are really advanced. And from the university, in the University of Buea, for example, you don't need to, to move to the university to apply for a transcript. So this is, this all depends. It's really relative. At the University of Yaoundé too, that, uh, that may seem more equipped is during the COVID pandemic context that they have been able to adapt their platform, but they did it so quickly, quicker than uh, other universities such as Ngaoundere or Marwa. And now coming to online uh, platform uh, teaching or online teaching, University of Marwa has been able <laughs> to adapt quicker than Eric, that seemed more funded and more equipped than the University of Mara. So I think it uh, all depends, and there is a question of leadership also, I think, uh, regarding the, um, uh, the process of adaptation here. 
And uh, yeah, uh, the the question about the radio courses on radio, these are deserve to level one and two uh, students at university. And why uh, radio course? First of all, uh, look at the looking at uh, taking a look at the uh, uh, um, of the at the I don't know how you call it, effective numbers of students. There are thousands at university. Uh, this is a point I, I needed to mention. There are thousand, almost two thousand, two thousand and five in level one and two. So it was difficult. According to exchanges I had with uh, administrative uh, staff, is that it's difficult to interact in uh, using a platform to interact with two thousand students at once, managing questions uh, on on virtual platform. So they just prefer a presenter, a lecturer to present the course and maybe uh, uh, get uh, two or three questions from the public intervening uh, directly uh, through the radio. And uh, regarding also the case of uh, WhatsApp groups, we observed that these are the kind of platform used only in small programs of 40 to 45 students, where it's more easier, though it takes like four hours, it's more easier uh, for for one side or the other side, lecturers and students to interact and have more close uh, discussions. So it it all depends. And I'm think um, I think that from that particular point of view, there is a question of leadership. Who is managing? Who is what's the relationship to of the manager or main actor to the technologies uh, themselves? It's very, very important. Thank you very much, uh, Mireille, and also for, for um, shedding light on what is happening right right now. That's very current research we get Thank to take you. part of there. At this point, I wanted to hand over to uh, Ms. Ndoum Lamini of the Association of African Universities. Uh, Ndoum, I think you have your... Yes. We can see you. Yes, there you are. Uh, so Ndoum, she is the Director of ICT Services and Knowledge Management at the AAU and therefore has a very particular vantage point to speak both from, uh, from her organizational uh, experience, but maybe also on behalf of, of her members, the uh, universities uh, in Africa. So Nudum, I give you 10 minutes. Okay, thank you ahead of me. And uh, as a discuss, uh, I, I, I think inclusivity is something that we, uh, we have learned or has been emphasized through COVID-19. The fact that there are diverse groups of uh, students and uh, people that need to be taken into consideration. And the biggest challenge, as has been said, is the broad infrastructure issues that really lead to a, a challenges with equity and access. And, and when we look at uh, some of these broad infrastructure issues, we need to remember that um, we must look at them at a campus level. If the campus infrastructure is weak, then that campus infrastructure cannot support uh, students and faculty remotely. And also there's national to reach the rural areas during COVID-19 challenges. Could you turn off your video to make the sound more stable? Okay. Thanks. Let me let me do that. Mm, let me do that. Sorry about that. No problem. Yeah. Let me stop my share. Okay. Uh, thank you. And now you can share the PowerPoint again. Yes, yeah. You can see it. Yeah. 
So the infrastructure issues need to be looked at at a campus level, at a national level, and also regional infrastructure level. We need our governments to be really looking at not just the urban areas in, 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 in terms of connectivity. For universities in Africa, we have what is called national research and education networks. Uh, the challenge is that they are not at the same level in, in terms of maturity. But uh, these institutions are the ones that are supposed to act as internet providers for educational and research institutions. So what we've seen during COVID-19 is that there have been negotiations that universities have been making with telecommunications companies to be able to address issues of connectivity for their students. Uh, the presentation on partnerships on a shoot string was very good, especially in relation to that funding has been more urgent needs and it seems like uh, education issues will not be priority for some time uh, until we fixed this uh, COVID. So as the Association of African Universities, we have focused our partnerships and providing expert advice to universities and helping them to verify providers, negotiating on their behalf, uh, speaking to some of the suppliers for consortium deals that the universities could access. And we've also been doing a lot of capacity building through uh, webinars. Um, we are also learning that uh, mother is the necessity of innovations. I think for a long time we've been trying to push universities to progress the digitization of their teaching, learning and research. And we thought uh, they were not moving fast enough. We also thought maybe it's a leadership issue. We needed more charismatic leaders to be able to move this agenda. But COVID has taught us that uh, when there's a need, uh, people or institutions are likely to listen. But we are seeing our universities in Africa not so prepared, especially in terms of handling emergency responses. We ran a survey uh, with the universities and they told us that the biggest challenge was responding fast enough so that they don't lose time. And uh, we saw, however, that they handled international students very well. And uh, we also learned that uh, some universities said they would be teaching fully. The majority said they would be teaching partially. And there was quite a big number which said we've closed and we are not teaching. The tools that universities are using, as the last presenter said, they are using email, they are using WhatsApp, they are using Google Classrooms, they are using Zoom. And uh, in terms of content, even though there's content out there from edX, Coursera and the like, uh, our investors are not yet using that. So we are trying to find a way to get them to look at that content and select what could be useful for them. But we know, of course, that academics sometimes resist using content that has been developed by other people. Learning management systems uh, are there. The challenge with uh, them is that the universities had not institutionalized them. So they are having to revisit their institutional policies, which says uh, the use of the learning management system is compulsory, and most of them are using Moodle. Uh, we also Three see... Remaining. Yeah, thank you. We also see a, a great need, uh, or rather our universities have been supporting their communities, developing... Uh, 
or manufacturing face masks or manufacturing hand sanitizers. In terms of high level research to find a cure, we find that there are a few universities uh, involved. Most of them are delegating their staff to participate in national uh, initiatives. So in conclusion, I think we agree that infrastructure is a big issue. Institutionalization of online education uh, is important. Even when COVID goes, we need to have blended approaches to teaching and learning. We think our investors should consider sharing infrastructure on the cloud in order to reduce costs so that they don't all do their own small things. Training, training, I think is very important and our curricula has been challenged. It must be skills focused. The way that we examine must be different. We must have different ways of uh, assessing whether learning has happened. And then offline learning solutions are also becoming very important radio tv podcasts sending materials to students that have no connectivity so thank you very much uh, thank you so much to the reform implementation committee of the federal ministry of education in nigeria his earlier work between january and may 2011 as chairman of the presidential tax team on education. Born some seven, nine, plus 11 months, and uh, 20, well, and 11 months and a few weeks ago, Paya Baya, if I may, was educated at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, where he obtained the Bachelor of Education in French, in education and French, with first class honors plus a distinction in practice teaching in June 9 PhD in language education he was he also holds the he also holds the diploma superior the student Frances Zalma Mata University of Ibado in the Institute of Education as research fellow in August 1971 he rose rapidly through the ranks to the grade of full professor by October 1979. That was a sorry, that was 40 years ago, but I was looking at it from a viewpoint of that was eight years after he was a fellow. Yeah, he was director of the Institute of Education in the University of Ibadan from 1980 to 1983. And while on sabbatical leave from Ibado in 1984, he served as Foundation Dean of Education in the Lagos State University, Lasso. Between 1976 and 1986, 10 years, Professor Bayer produced of education in work of time. At the international level, Professor Bayer was for a decade 1976 to city building initiatives for national curriculum in 22 African countries. He was program coordinator for education for the World Federation of, Org of Organizations of the Teaching Profession, WCOTP, based in Mount Switzerland from 1986 to 1988. He joined the services of UNESCO in August 1988 and served as Deputy Director from 1988 to 1991 and later Director from of the Regional Office for services rendered to the organization. He is the designer of, the Ni of Nigeria's Universal Basic Education, UBE and spent the period January 2000 to May 2001 setting up the structures for its effective takeoff. Professor Obaya has been spending his years of very active retirement. He says that, which is a word, 
research and training services to international development cooperation agencies, Pan-African institutions, national governments, non-governmental organizations, tertiary institutions, and the private sector. It is in this capacity that he has played the lead role in the development of education sector, strategic plan 36 states of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. This lead role function has also been extended to the following projects. I'll just mention a few. The development of the NEPAC education strategy document, 2015 program of African Union, as well as uh, developing the roadmap for 2016 to 2020 for Nigeria UBE. He also developed <clears throat> a strategy plan for the transformation of ABM University um, College in Botswana into a full-fledged university. There are several others. He's a diehard academic known as the Grand Sage of Education in Africa. Professor Payo Bayer has authored some 286 publications on different aspects of education. He is a well sought after keynote speaker on education. His contributions to educational development have earned him a good number of honors. He is happily married and blessed with well-established children, up-and-coming grandchildren, and many more grandchildren to come. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming this um, iconic doyen of education, a scholar sui generis, a globally decorated celebrity academic, and the grand wizard of education. You're welcome, sir. Well, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce myself properly. I'm simply an 80-year-old beginning student of education. And if you look at the screen along with me, it says how we move from... Say it, say it aloud, everybody. Moving from, uh, I didn't hear you. Uh -huh, in a classroom, I would have said clap for yourselves. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to proceed as fast as I can. Uh, it's a discussion flow, the what, the why, the how, and I end with this. So as we go on, the what? That's part one. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the sum total of the what is this. I'm dealing with two opposing approaches to teaching. The, promi the more prominent one, the one with, uh, sorry, uh, uh, telling. The latter, which is uh, guiding, we'll see in the next series of slides. One, in terms of materials for teaching, in telling, you lose the, the textbook, you follow it from page one to page end. Whereas in this one, the one we are, we are proposing, you have a wider variety of both test and non-test. Non-test. You have out of class activities to classroom, to sorry, to complement what you do in the lecture room. Next, the teacher. The work of the teacher was what we call frontal teaching. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to discuss democracy. Democracy has been defined by Thompson and Jacobson as, and according to Thompson and Jacobson as, do you understand? If you don't understand, that's your problem. <laughs> that is what you do in telling, or what I call lecturating. <laughs> but if you teach, if you want to guide people, to develop themselves. You read after me at that point. The teacher does what? Let's hear you loud. Yes. 
in the normal one, you bend. And the man writes, you write. When he coughs, you write, cough. When he sneezes, you write, sneeze. What does the learner do? The learner listens, takes teacher dictated notes, talks only when. You see all this? You take your notes, but in an analytical manner. It is not when you think you want to keep, uh, you want to note for the future. So, ladies and gentlemen, what is democracy? Democracy is the rule of the people, of the people, of the people, of the people. Examination. What is democracy? Democracy is the rule of the people, of the people, of the people. So, memorization, rote learning. So, facts, figures, and so on. But here, it says a wider variety. You can say lecture room, flexible, analytical, and creative thinking promoted. I give you what I mean by creative thinking. 1955, yesterday you were there. A student says to the teacher, what's the meaning of collapse? He says to die. And I say, excuse me, sir, it's not to die. He said, big head. In the end, he said, okay, what have you got to say? I said, Mr. Christian Menon, India's permanent representative to the UN, collapsed last week and did not die. The teacher didn't know whether Christian Menon was an animal or a human being or anything. He just said, where do you live? He said, go to the slum. Get out of my class. <laughs> when you disagree with the teacher, you are encouraged. So, ladies and gentlemen, we continue. We are more interested in what you take away, the learning outcomes. Here, once teacher tells you, and you repeat what the teacher has said, they will clap for you. But here, because you've been engaged, see what happens to you. Let's read together. You want to go and learn more about it. Uh -huh. well, it isn't done to yellow, isn't it? it says, without calling it even titration, uh, something will happen to you afterwards. So if that has happened to you, that hands on, that when you are faced with novel experiences, you can apply. And creativity is always rewarded. In other words, we all be doing it the same way. And you come out with a novel way of doing it. Instead of saying shut up, we say clap for the girl. So ladies and gentlemen, now the emphasis I said is on learning outcomes. I don't know how clear this is, so I'll read it. While telling results in memorization and registration, guiding is more likely to encourage lifelong and lifelong learning, learning as well as creative thinking. Telling who have worked in an era of highly competitive universities. When I was growing up, Ibadan was the only university, and it would admit only 100 from the whole federation. So the people already know book. Whether you teach them or not, they will know. So in that era, you could stand as a lecturer and poor. Shakespeare was born in England, blah, 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 and then the student will say poor, and you continue. And you are considered brilliant because you could poor facts. But today, with jam bites and all that, you have it a, you are becoming less selective. And so the people come with different levels of preparation. So this is the mass of the era of mass higher education. And the world is changing. And because the world is changing, we we'll want to see what is changing in the world quickly. In the it is not a novel idea. People went to what you call teacher training colleges. That was what they were taught. One thing they were taught is to memorize, I teach John Latin. Can you say that? I teach John Latin. Repeat. In order to teach John Latin, repeat. I must not only know Latin, I must, I must also know John. You can deduce from that. The demands and the dictates of changing times. And what are they? First of all, today's student profile. I will not read this. But in my time, 
you would have left secondary school, Cambridge, you would have entered the only university in the world, you would have been paying school fees to, for your siblings for the past five years, and when you come to Ibadan, we say, you know why you came to Ibadan. Eh? Perhaps the only person to go to university in your, in your village, and so on. And the world is looking forward for you to graduate and start earning and training everybody, and buy a car and become senior service. And you were, your age was, if you were 21, they say you're in a small pekin. You'll be 26, 27, and so on. Or more, even 47. Politician. Uh, in those days, you didn't know what a typewriter was. But a 15-year-old has a system. <laughs> huh? <laughs> and so on. In those days, the teacher was the only source. At best, the old textbook. Today... When, you, when they tell you my name, you Google it. Oh, oh. Today, when I send, I used to send invitation, now I send, you don't call it invitation in Nigerian English, now you say invite. You send invite by what's up and what is not up. Huh? And so, <laughs> what we're saying is that this person is living in a different world. And the way the girls are dressed here is the same way the girls in Austria and Mexico will dress. And the moment something Jackson, you release a, a musical something in Mississippi, you're also dancing it in La Lucmo and El Doret and so on. And you no longer have men in the schools, they are called guys. Am I right? <laughs> because they are called guys everywhere. You no longer have discussion. It simply means a one world phenomenon. Wherever you are, you are part of the world. And so, there is nothing like this is Nigeria. Hmm? There is what you call international best practices. You cannot say this is Nigeria. So when the girls, when the girls, blouse is when you cover all of this. Top is when it starts here and ends here. <laughs> huh? Or what do you call trousers? It is the one that starts here and goes down and exposes what it should not expose. Is it not true? or the gene that is caught here and here and here. What I'm saying is that when something happens in the past, okay, when I did my own GCE 50 years ago or more, it was posted in Lagos, it took seven days to get to Ibadan. Today you do the jam in the morning, you get the result in your phone in the afternoon. So it's all part of, you know, uh, this idea of moving from mere tech. This, this one thing about this world that is changing is this, there are no jobs. Right or wrong? But there is work. Can you reconcile the two? There are no jobs. But there is work. And so we are not preparing people to a world of, they will employ you in ministry of this. We are and prepare you for a world as you go into the world for those who use those talents. While there may be no job for those who refuse to think. So, what type of teaching? That is the guide. So, ladies and gentlemen, there is what has become known as the knowledge economy. I know you know about it. I will not go further. But I'll just underline we in Western Nigeria were richer than the other three, two regions. Why? We had cocoa. Today they say the Niger Delta is richer because it has, what does it have now? Petroleum oil. Oh, I thought it was palm oil. Petroleum, okay. But strictly speaking, knowledge economy says commodity does knowledge to steal it from you eh, like you do with our own oil steal it from nigeria refine it come here and sell it back to nigeria so very soon if we if you continue to teach as telling we'll produce cassava here somebody will take it abroad transform it to gary and come to sell to us and we call it two 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 you hear people in Nigeria say every day, these children are not doing well. They are all looking for what? Every job requires you are using your brain. If you doubt it, you are not dri being driven by a driver. Most of the time, you, cannot, you don't say that driver cannot hold the wheel. You can say he can't use his head. You have a cook. He makes a mistake. Oh, what's wrong with you? I've been telling you, telling you. You are saying he cannot use his brain. So every... And third... And third, when we used to have commodities, you cite your factory in uh, Ijebu Day for timber because there's 
there's a mahogany there, and so Ijebode has comparative advantage. Now it is no longer comparative advantage. Competitive when you use your brain, your talents, even when it is not in your background, in fact, you have to make use of it. Give you an example. MTN has 6 million people in South Africa where it comes from. In Nigeria, it has 60 million. Have you ever seen the owner of MTN? Does he even know where Nigeria is located? But he's using knowledge to capture you. And if you're a true Nigerian, you won't be like me. I'm the only Nigerian with only one phone. Every one of you has two, three, four, five. <laughs> and it is not a commodity that you manufacture. So the knowledge, knowledge makes it possible. <laughs> so uh, let, me, uh, let me go on. Now, I said earlier, I said earlier that there may be no jobs, but there, is, uh, there may be no jobs, but there is work. Now, everybody is engaged in the future of work. In the future of work. And that is all you have here. But let me just... Now, we no longer talk of the labor market. Labor market means a world in which you engage in socioeconomically productive activities. Now, we used to say qualifications. What did you read? BSc, MSc, MBA, PPP, the one where you don't get, then dash them. But ladies and gentlemen, have you noticed in this country that when the banks advertise for their, what do you call it, aptitude testing, people with banking and finance degree will fail, and those with Arabic and Islamic studies will pass. If you have not noticed, I want you to notice. The person goes there bragging, I studied MSc Banking and Finance. The other one says, I have no hope. I... The abilities they are testing for are not in the textbook. And it's only people who have gone through the process of guiding who get to pass those aptitude tests. So qualifications are no longer as important as personal quality. Now, now, ICT, what did I say there? Uh -huh. It is not computer literacy. Computer literacy, you know how to operate it. Computer literacy, send me an email. After three weeks, and you know that email is easier for you, and you can go ahead and do so. Without saying, ah, these children are better come and show me how to Google. So, ICT, we'll come to that. Now, today, what is this one? Graduate is a stark reality. But look at this one. It's compounded unemployability. were governed by ICT, versatility, and so on. The type of skills you need now, from my work, is not from a textbook, unless you are reading my own textbook. <laughs> uh, they are in three categories. The type of skill, you know mathematics, you know geography, that is hard skills. You can write a reasoned essay, that is hard skill. Soft skill. Let me illustrate soft skill. My granddaughter comes, or my grandson comes with a young woman and says to grandma, meet my, what do you call them, fiancé. And the young woman... So, it's just to illustrate what you mean by soft skills and emotional intelligence. Meaning, um, let's say it in Nigerian English. You know book. That's hard book. You'll be a good person. Good character, all that. Those are soft skills. And, importantly, what is this one? 
a roasting fish and you know all the chemical chemicalology of roasting fish and the yami in the marketplace roast fish without knowing the chemicalology by working with her you will learn from her and she will learn from you and by the time they change the way what they are doing for the better you become a change agent and you know when you change something another problem arises and you continue that's why you are committed so there are three c's consummate researcher creative teacher committed change and academic what it sold today and these are related to what universities are set up for ladies and gentlemen now <laughs> What we call knowledge has also changed. And I want you, everybody, to recite what I have here with me. Have we started? Knowledge is? Repeat. Oh, recitation. You've all passed. Clap for yourself. You know, in our Nigerian language, you know book. But you also know that when you interact with our people sometimes and you talk your book, they tell you, oh God, that is book. Now let's talk the real problem. The same thing is happening in today's world of work. You do know as a result of your education. And the employer, or you even you employ yourself, you are looking up what you can do with what you know in view of who you are. And it's not just my certificate, it's first class. So, ladies and gentlemen, what do you say? Guiding. But you look at this now. We are talking about knowledge now. And it says two ways of looking at knowledge. Let's look at this together. Codified knowledge. Repeat with me. Codified knowledge. What is it? Our teacher said so. The textbook said so. Eh? The latest research from Cambridge said so. And who am I to argue? Now look at this regenerative knowledge. What does he say? But I want you to answer this question. Regenerative knowledge. So when we say removing from telling to guide all, so that that knowledge is used to continuous develop, for the continuous development of the individual. And so <laughs> another thing has been said about learning learning let's look at it together the lowest level adopting what i was told what i have read what i have googled this one you have now thought about it you have practiced and you have modified it and what about this uh -huh. so what level should uh, university teachers go to there is something called abstract now which is not the name of any person or anything. <laughs> and then one day you decide to call it something else. So in the real world of today, in the real world of today, you operate at this level. Those who employ you and when you employ yourself, you have to be creative to remain, <laughs> to remain uh, competitive. So ladies and gentlemen, I was 85, who read the papers and interpret to our parents here in Ibadan. And so they asked, what is this university college? You know his answer? It means that from today go, Nigerians will not go overseas to study again. <laughs> that was how he interpreted the idea of a university. And when we were going to Eleyele to fetch firewood, the university campus of Eleyele, we saw these men in their ties. And they were speaking, they said, it doesn't matter. As soon as we leave them, we also started saying, it doesn't matter. We even know how many universities they are uh, today. And the Dino, they moved, and you, that was the Abba Dino you call Abba, where the Abba that belonged to a Dino. Eh? We moved them, we bulldozed them out, and everybody will come to visit our zoo, to visit our biology more than that. They've seen those who've come and gone, no improvements. The world out there says that we do not, that is we university, we do not inculcate the skills that they need. And to understand these needs, we have to move closer to them. Hmm? And we have to know what they are doing so that we produce, uh, we produce people who will do something useful in society. 
and teaching as guiding is one of those things. So I come to the how. That is more important, and I'm going to be brief. To sniff all the grass before, because by sniffing, he gets to know which one will not be all right. So to be a reflective teacher is not, do we keep the windows open? Not enough. Can we arrange how best to sit? The thing they call blackboard is no longer black. It is even white. What do we do about it? Uh, the children are coming from another lab to your lab. It takes time to walk across. What do we do? So it's a lot of work when you say pre-teaching. Now, work. Let's hear you. Don't let the rain disturb you. Let's hear your voice. Louder than the rain. The more you talk, the more they write down, but the less they learn because it has no influence on them. And when you look at this pyramid, I don't know if you can see it, but what it says is this. When you lecture, only lecture. Only 5%. When you run around to demonstrate, it increased to 30%. When you add all the... <coughs> and when you say, now, sit around the table, let's discuss what you know, teach those who don't know about you, you get to that. Practice brings... See what is dif different there. So it be and call one red or whatever. It applies to every discipline. Let's go again to democracy. Democracy is you are putting the label first. But if people are in a situation of participatory 